Hello, good evening, and welcome to the first in this brand new series of the ROR Winter Webinars for 2021 and, of course, going into 2022. Today, we're going to be looking all things horse management, looking at those all-important first steps, including the all-important subjects of equine nutrition, dentistry and saddlery, all of which will play a vital role in those early foundations and for getting the very best out of your former racehorse. Before we go any further, we must say a huge thank you, not only to the organising team of, of these webinars, but also the Levy Board, who uh, have really helped us put on this brand new uh, series of webinars. We are really very grateful, and we know many of you are too, because last year they were very, very popular. And as always, these webinars are for all of you and uh, helping you with your former racehorses. Before we go any further, then let's introduce the guests that are going to be joining me. We've got four brilliant guests. So uh, let's get to finding out who they are. So the first of them that is going to be joining us this evening is Donna Case. Donna is an independent nutritionist who runs her consultancy, The Horse Feed Guru, from her base in Newmarket. She operates both nationally and internationally and gained experience as a commercial nutritionist, but now works independently across all feed brands and consequently is able to recommend the most suitable diet for your horse, whatever the brand. Her aim is to demystify the haze and often confusion that does seem to surround feeding horses and provides the best possible advice in a form that people can pick up and run with, not only on the day of her visit, but also for the weeks, months and, uh, and even years really that follows. Above all, her love for horses and wanting the very best for them remains at the forefront and she provides nutritional advice in the form of yard visits, nutritional talks and of course in webinars and as an expert speaker in events like tonight. And Donna is pictured. Also joining us this evening, B May. B has been around horses all her life, sitting on her first horse at the age of three. She's been a member of the Hampshire Hunt Pony Club and competes to a high level in both show jumping and eventing, been involved as well in running a livery yard and competition yard, and has been a fully qualified equine dentist for seven years, having first graduated from Harpy College with an equine dental science degree in 2012, before going on to pass the equine dental technician's exam in 2014. Her day-to-day -day life involves visiting all manner of horses from racing yards to competition yards and individual horse owners, looking after everything from racehorses to donkeys. So B May joins us this evening as our qualified equine dental technician. So you won't see uh, the next two ladies in this short video clip, but you'll get to meet them very shortly. The first of those is Kay Hastelow, who is a master saddler and a former president of the Society of Master Saddlers. Having learnt her trade with London firm Bliss & Co, Kay started her own business in 1970, making bridles work for retail and individuals alike. With Kay's experience in ridden competition, she recognised that there was no separate recognition of the demands of saddle fitting, and Kay was able to understand what worked, didn't work, and put it in a basic form that owners can take and use in their everyday equitation. For Kay, position, security and comfort for the rider and comfort, as well as the horse, are her priorities and will be putting her wealth of knowledge working with fellow professionals, prospective saddle fitters, vets and physiotherapists to the test tonight. And last but not least, we've got the brilliant Dr Jenny Hall, who is the ROR Head of Welfare and is also the current chair of the FEI Veterinary Committee. Her entire career has been dedicated to the health and well-being of equines. And you will remember Jenny from last year. So we'll get to meet uh, Jenny very shortly. And she will, as always, I'm sure, bring her expertise through the various sections that we've got to look forward to. And the first of those sections, we're going to start and hopefully work through quite strategically. But those of you that were with us last year know it can sometimes uh, we get a little bit uh, distracted when a topic takes us. So I'm sure that will be the case this time. Before we go any further, don't forget you can... Uh, ask questions. These webinars are purely for you. Uh, so please do get your questions. You've, I'm sure, used Zoom a million times now. So you'll be able to put your questions in the Q&A box and we will try and get to as many as possible later on. We do have a number of questions already lined up. So hopefully they'll give you plenty of answers. But if not, put your questions into us. And I know the team will do their best to make sure they're answered even afterwards by email if needs be. So we're going to start off with nutrition and essentially a really good starting point too, because all, almost fundamental of everything uh, that we're going to work from here on in, we need our horses to be healthy. And the diet, of course, 
is a big uh, thing there. So let's start off with a short video. This video is all about condition scoring, and then we'll reintroduce Donna, and uh, Donna will show us a little bit more about how to condition score and what it really means for us with former racehorses. Have a look at this video. When we're dealing with the racehorse running on the track and considering the body condition score that they will be, we would expect them to be around four, which is moderately thin. Now, many horse owners believe that five moderate is absolutely perfect. And in many cases it is. We don't want to be seeing overweight horses and ponies. However, there are certain things we have to take into account. Seasonal fluctuations can be one of those things. But also, when we've got a very hard working horse like this, we wouldn't expect them to be moderate. Perfect for them would be moderately thin. If you think about the human world, someone like Mo Farah running on the track, we would not expect them to carry any excess fat at all because they would burn this with the sheer amount of exercise that they're doing. And it's exactly the same in the racehorse. So don't be scared by a condition score of moderately thin. In these horses, that is exactly what we would expect to see. So a great video there. So a huge thanks to Donna Case for putting that video together. It was a short video introducing something which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Most of us know about it, uh, condition scoring. But what does it really mean? And, and I think, uh, Donna, uh, to you, we're going to look at some slides I know that you're, you've put together for or we've, we've been provided uh, that you're going to talk through. But before we go on to that, how important is condition scoring as a foundation to deciding what to feed your horse down the line? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so body condition scoring is essentially um, as assessing the fat coverage of the horse in front of us. It's not actually a, um, an assessment of muscle tone, although obviously I can um, I can pick up that. Um, but it is an assessment of fat and why it's so important it's the starting point of everything essentially because what it shows us is where we are in that moment in time so is the horse about the has he got about the right um fat coverage for the work that he's doing and for the time of year etc so taking that into account as i just touched on very briefly in that video um or actually is he overweight um, is he slightly underweight? If he is slightly underweight, is it acceptable? So, for example, what I mean by that is um, at the end of winter, you might want the horse to be slightly underweight headed into spring. So it, it's the foundation, if you like, of everything I will then use to start to um, build the diet and build the, the, the ration. Um, and I think we've got um, some slides from when I uh, filmed that video. I think if we could have the first slide up. Now, the first thing I want to say ab uh, about this is it is from a slightly dodgy angle here and we are missing the horse's neck. Um, and that is actually quite a crucial part of the uh, body condition scoring process. But what I will say is these, these slides have come from actually what's going to be a fantastic video that everyone's going to be able to um, access. So I, I definitely encourage people to, to watch that video um, when it's released. But as we can see here, this is um, a, a horse that has been out of training for around six months and it is on the leaner side, but exactly what we would expect to see um, from, from a, a former racehorse that is, is, is not that long out of training. Um, and I think it's really important to remember that they are athletes and we are going to expect them to look lean. Um, but actually what I'm seeing in front of me, we've become very used to seeing overweight horses, very attuned to seeing that. And when we actually see horses that in effect are either at the lower end of moderate or moderately thin, to some people, it can actually make them, they, they can feel they're quite underweight and they're not necessarily. So if you take um, that, that picture there, 
I mean, you can't even see the ribs particularly. Um, but what I will say again about pictures is palpating the horse. So actually physically feeling the fat coverage is a major part of body condition scoring, which you, you can't make out from, from a photograph. But that's um, a good first side. And, and, and actually that horse is exactly what I would expect to see after six months um, of, of you know, not running. Um, could we have the next slide, please? So this particular horse is actually in full training at the moment. Again, unfortunately, we are missing the neck. Um, and again, th this horse would come in at moderately thin, but I don't want people to panic and think, oh God, you know, moderately thin. Actually, that is exactly what we'd expect to see. Um, what I could, uh, we, we haven't got ex excessive rib coverage on show by any stretch of the imagination. In actual fact, this racehorse, um, when you see it in the flesh, looks absolutely fantastic uh, picture of health. Um, it's difficult when we're looking at body condition scoring. So the, the system that I use is um, called Hineki scoring system, if people uh, want to Google it. And it's on a one to nine scale with five being moderate. And we're assessing six key areas. So we're assessing the neck, the shoulder, the withers, the ribs, the loins, which is the bit um, just behind where the saddle sits and the tail head. Um, and yeah, a, a very much what we would expect to see from a racehorse in training. I'm very happy with that con condition score. If we could have the next slide, please. And this particular horse had been out of training for uh, around a year, more like two years, actually, and was very much being used for leisure work. Now, actually, what you can't really make out from that photograph is there were actually um, a few fat pads here and there on that particular horse. So it was actually um, just creeping in to that six category. But again, you, it's very hard to see that from just a photograph. So I really would encourage people when that video is released to have a good look at that because it explains it in much more depth. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Donna. Um, a couple of things before we go any further, actually, I'm slightly going to put you on the spot, so which is what I do with everybody that comes on these webinars. Um, I think what some people may ask is, well, firstly, how often would you reassess your horse for, for a start? And secondly, in things like a lot of people talk about weighing their horse, whether they might be lucky enough to have a weigh bridge or they might be using those tapes, which, of course, are open to all sorts of, um, you know, how accurate are they really? What's your thoughts on both of those things? So my thoughts are, obviously, it's the dream if you've got a Weybridge, but let's be realistic, most people haven't. And, you know, there, there may be some point in the year where they're fortunate enough to be able to use one. But actually, do you know what? That's not all that helpful, um, you know, on an ongoing basis. Yes, it might be brilliant from a veterinary point of view, it, you know, at just that precise moment in time. Um, but on, on an ongoing basis, if we haven't got a Weybridge um, lying around on a yard, actually what's really useful is, is the body condition scoring. And there are um, apps available to help you that you can download on your phone and lots of websites that can talk it, you know, through that process. But what I would say is the most powerful thing is body condition scoring in conjunction with weight taping. Mm -hmm. And, you know, weight taping gets a lot of bad press. And the reason for that is because we do know it, it can be out and it can fluctuate from 30 to 50 kilos. Um, it can be out. But where it is really useful is that it shows the horse going up and going down in weight that your eye alone may not notice. So when you're using it in conjunction with the body condition scoring and you're using the weight tape on a regular basis, so I'd say for, for, for most horses, if you could do that on a three week basis, fantastic. Um, you know, if you're looking at the more overweight horse more frequently than that, um, but really, really regularly and make a note of the weight alongside your body condition scoring. And, and that really, to me, is going to be a million times better than going off to some show once a year, weighing your horse. And then, you know, six weeks later could be totally different. And, and just one um, more sort of connection to that, really, again, which I think is a practical question that people might be thinking about here. 
is if you find that you're regularly condition scoring, you know, every few weeks you're doing, you're just sort of monitoring, maybe you're, you've got a new former race, a former race source. Um, if you start to notice things changing, so all of a sudden you think, oh, the condition's getting worse, how quickly would you make an adjustment to the diet? Would you base it on one reading or viewing alone, the scoring alone, or would you look again in three weeks, another for three weeks before being too sort of rash in, in the changes? Yeah, so I certainly wouldn't be rash and I wouldn't panic immediately because what we're looking and it's the same with all horses really is that they will fluctuate slightly Mm. and and even throughout the day they're going to fluctuate which is why it's so important particularly when doing a weight tape reading to always choose the same time of day to to um, to take that reading Um, but inevitably there will be times when that weight goes up slightly or it comes down slightly but what what would worry me more is if you see a consistent downhill trend so yeah. the odd or or uphill trend um the odd deviation from that isn't too much of a problem but what i would probably do is if you're um starting to notice perhaps some little blips here and then maybe up the frequency so if you're only doing it on a three weekly basis maybe do it on a a, a weekly or two weekly so you can just keep it um a, a closer tab on it if you like. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Donna. Sorry to have just thrown those extra questions in, but I think they're, they're quite sort of practical and probably things which people are, are going to be facing at the moment as they're, they're looking to do that. And just very briefly, and I know this is a big loaded question, but um, just briefly, what are the specific differences between a horse's nutritional requirements, you know, scientifically, mm. from a horse in training to a horse that is now retraining for its second career? Well, do you know what? It's a lot simpler than it is than it needs to be really and and that's going to be the main difference is the um, energy supply in the diet is going to be much higher in the racehorse in 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 training than is going to be for your former racehorse that's starting a new career because you know if you just think of the the amount of work that a racehorse is doing it's far greater than what what you're going to be doing with um your former racehorse so so the major thing is going to be that energy difference and then the other thing likely is that in training um is more likely to have had a much higher starch level in the feed and it's starch that comes from your cereals so like your oats, your maize, your barley, um, that, you know, that's that that's the source of that. So um, the racehorse in training would much likely have much higher starch level than you would probably uh, want or need in uh, your former racehorse, if you if you like. OK, uh, and a common question that we we always get asked and, and this is i suppose the stereotypical sort of how we think of ex- the former racehorses um, many owners are looking to improve condition particularly at this time of year but they don't want to add um too much fizz to the horse they don't want the horse to be bouncing off the walls um how is the best way and i know i realize we always caveat these things it's the individual everybody needs to check about that individual horse but generally what's the best way to do this so when we're feeding the excitable or spooky or, or, or sharp horse, if you like, one of the most important things we can do, it's all around the way in which we supply that energy. So we want the diet to be based around highly digestible fibres and oils and have a lower level of those cereal starches because it, it's the starch um, that can exacerbate, if you like, some of that spooky difficult behavior so um the first thing i say to you is is when looking at feeds go onto the relevant websites and look at the starch levels of those feeds if you've got an excitable horse you want to keep that as controlled as you can and and there's some feeds on the market that have got fantastic energy levels and energy being calories essentially so if you're needing to keep weight on have really low starch levels so we you know we're talking five percent starch and and you might actually look at the feed you're giving at the moment and and think oh goodness you know what i'm giving is 20 percent starch so that that's quite a difference um and that's really going to help you on that front and we, we should remember as well that not all former racehorses are fizzy and want to go mm-hmm. flying off. Actually, this relates a little bit more perhaps to an equitation issue, behavioural issue, but some of them are a little bit backwards in their way of going early on. And they're almost lazy by the sort of definition, that it, an easy definition. But of course, there are more things below that. Um, what would you do in that situation if the horse almost is, is not fizzy? Actually, it's, it's a lot more laid back. 
Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, I wouldn't be too fast to jump into to um, in trying to resolve that, particularly if it's a new horse, because you never quite know how they might react a few weeks down the line. So I'd, I'd get that real initial getting the horse settled in, getting used to that horse, because things can change. The wind can set in, the gremlins appear. Uh, but, you know, to be fair, there will be those I will say first um, and foremost, just make sure that, 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 that you're confident that there are no sort of medical problems that might mean the horse isn't wanting particularly to, to move forward. But if, you know, everything's fine with the horse and, and the tax fine and all of that side of things uh, and, and you're getting the training there and you're still struggling, and feel like you want a little bit more. That's where elevating the starch level slightly can actually be quite useful Um because it, it might give you a bit more ping or a bit more sparkle. But what I would say on that is don't just um, jump to do that. So, so what I mean is, let's say you're on 10% starch at the moment. Don't go going, wow, I'm going to go up to 30% starch. You know, you might want to try something at 16% starch or around that figure and, and see. It doesn't have to be a massive difference. And the other big point I want to touch on is that if your horse has got um, clinical history of gastric ulcers, um, actually, we need to keep that starch level controlled and it might not be appropriate to do that. OK, well, that's going to lead us on to nicely, actually, to something I'm going to talk to Jenny about shortly. But just uh, before I do, um, what about turnout? Because a lot of the time when somebody gets a former racehorse, it will not have been, if perhaps it's very recently out of training, it may well not have been in the field at all, if if for any length of time. So how would you deal with the forage element, the grass, the hay, the hay? How on earth, when you've just got that horse home in the first few weeks, how, how would you address that? Yeah, well, I think we've got to remember as well that racehorses in training have quite a high level of concentrate feed and often quite a low level of forage. And um, I've certainly dealt with a, a number of former racehorses now, and I, I used to be a racing nutritionist in a previous past, um, that actually when they are in their new homes, if you like, eating enough forage, because we talk about feeding plenty of forage, and that is really important. But initially, when they first get settled in, they might not be used to um, having much and might actually turn their noses up at it, which can stress a lot of owners out. And I think it's about going gently, gently. Um, you may find that you have to take strategies on board, such as using a high fiber cube, because many of them might have been used to having um, cube, quite, quite high cube based diets, for example. So you can use something like a high fiber cube as a partial forage replacer if you're panicking that the horse just isn't taking enough forage in. So that's one good strategy. Um, there, there are of course other types of forage replacers, but just from a very practical and having a lot of experience with former racehorses, that's a really useful way to do it. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the turnout, again, so you've got the behavioral piece there and the nutritional piece in, in that they won't have been used to it. And rather than just bunging them out in the field, it might be wise to increase that time quite gradually so that they can become acclimatized that from a nutritional perspective, but also so they're not going to go out there and break all four legs um, and, and have us on the phone to Jenny. So, um, yeah, build everything up. Another useful thing uh, to introduce into the diet could be a, a probiotic and prebiotic. They, they often come in combined forms, so probiotic and prebiotic together. Um, and that can just help to support the hindgut um, microbiome and, and it is really useful. Thank you, Donna. Really, really good points. You've crammed loads in there. Um, so thank you very much for that. And it did uh, you did lead us and mention uh, gastric ulcers. So Jenny, uh, to you. Let's talk about the not very glamorous, not very glamorous on a Wednesday evening chat, but very, very important and an issue that always pops up. It, we've talked about it last year as well. Um, Jenny, how common really are ulcers in former racehorses? Well, they're certainly common, Mark, as we know, with horses in training. You know, a high, a high percentage of horses in training will... Uh, at some point have gastric ulcers so as um donna's already touched on you know your former racehorse may be known to have a previous history of ulcers 
But um, if he comes and you don't know anything about him, I guess my first advice would be not to worry about them too much initially because he's got to settle in and he's going to have massive changes in his lifestyle and in his amount of forage intake and, as we've just heard so nicely from, from Donna, about the composition of his diet. So I think you've kind of got to give him a chance to adjust to all of that. And that may well, you know, that may re well resolve any ulcers that he has, because certainly um, diagnosing them and treating them is quite an expensive undertaking. Um, nowadays, I think the gold standard really is gastroscopy. Um, you know, when you put a long fiber optic endoscope down into the stomach and actually visualize the stomach lining so that you can see and take photographs of any ulcers that he does have and there are different types of ulcers there's um, some that need different treatments so I think it is a good starting point to do the gastroscopy um, most practices nowadays will do it at your own stables so you don't have to transport the horse into a clinic um, he does have to fast pretty effectively beforehand so that you can actually see the stomach lining. Um, but your vet will give you clear instructions about, you know, how long that needs to be for and how to do that. Um, in terms of costs, I'd say you're looking at in the region of £250 um, plus your normal visit charge to get a gastroscopy done. And then you're looking at the cost of medication. Um, and this can be this is even more expensive. So a sort of two weeks treatment's probably going to be in the region of another four hundred and fifty pounds, including the VAT. Um, so as I say, it's not a process to be undertaken lightly. And because the medication is so expensive, I think that's why I'm inclined to recommend you do do the gastroscopy rather than just trying them on medication. But there are various supplements. Um, most of the manufacturers have some sort of, you know, uh, some sort of um, antacid or gastrocare, gastric support type product that may be a first, a first line of um, to, to approach. But, but as I say, I would certainly give your horse, you know, a good six to eight weeks to acclimatize to his new environment before I even thought about doing any diagnostics but but absolutely one to to discuss with your own vet and, and just to be clear jenny um if your horse is not displaying any symptoms that you think would dis would in indicate that there might be ulcers going on are you saying that actually in that situation you would do nothing until or, or would you routinely think that if somebody has got the money and the inclination to do that then a, a sort of routine check is fine Oh, it, you know, a routine check is fine, but I certainly, um, I certainly would be, wouldn't be advocating um, that needing to be done. You know, not, not in the way that um, you know you might want to to check other things like soundness and and you know it's absolutely important to do their teeth properly as we're gonna we're gonna have that discussion, aren't we? But to me, that if he's not eating his forage very well, the first thing is to get his teeth checked. Um, and and as as Donna said, you know, try some, give him a bit of a smorgasbord. You know, try a few alternatives to find something that he likes. So I mean, you know, you read on the, you know, read on various chats that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of chat about ulcers. They are common, but um, you know, sometimes I think they they can get blamed for you know they can they can i think get more um attention than they deserve sometimes <laughs> that's for sure excellent thank you jenny as always thank you for giving us that really good explanation uh, about ulcers and thank you uh, as well to donna for that uh, brilliant segment on nutrition so now we're going to move on in reverse we're going to go uh, back to the teeth uh where all of this begins and B, uh, I'm going to come to you just on the other side of this short video, which is just going to talk about dentistry. So when we start an examination on a horse, um, doesn't matter what they do or yeah, where they come from, we always look at their face and if there are any lumps or bumps at a place, we run our hands up and we have a little feel um, around the TMJ. Um, Roll it back to feel the glands and the jawbone. And this is just an indication to see if there's anything 
going on with a particular younger horse. Um, they might have some teething bumps or also referred as eruption cysts. Um, so it's all of these things that we can keep an eye out, which can give us a sign of there's something going on and there isn't. This little chap has a nice little bony bump here. Now it's fairly solid, it's not moving. So it'd be something I would make the owner aware of. Um, we would discuss it and possibly it might be worth having a look at, but it doesn't seem to be causing him any discomfort and he's not reacting particularly to it. So that's good. Um, also have a little look at eyes and nose and see if there's any discharge can, coming out of them because that can be a sign, especially from the nose, if it's one-sided um, and it's quite smelly. Um, sometimes it can be a sign that's uh, something going on with the root of the tooth. Well, thank you to B for that uh, really insightful video, just introducing uh, the aspect of dentistry, which, of course, as we've already mentioned in this uh, webinar, is really important. Uh, B. Um, just underline in terms of, I, I mean, I've just said it, it is very important, but it, it really is, isn't it, fundamental to everything. And it's not just from the health perspective. It actually impacts the behavior or the equitation. It really is everything. And they talk about no foot, no horse. Well, no teeth, no horse as well. Yeah, it's definitely a um, link in one of the links of a healthy horse, I'd say. Um, and for me, the one of the most important things of the dentistry is basically making the horse comfortable, um, improving the efficiency of the mastication. Um, horses eat in a more of a figure of eight motion. So being able to make sure the mouth can move in that action will help them um, digest the food so it can pass through the system a bit easier. Um, preventing any problems occurring, keeping an eye out. Um, the little things like we, decay in teeth, fractures, this and that, which controlling any major malocclusions or pathology that we might have come across so hooks ramps other things that we can go into a bit later on um and the biggest thing is we get a lot of people ask you know why why do you have you know the wild they don't have their horses teeth on it because we domesticated them because we have changed their diet because of how we now keep horses is re really we why we need to really keep their teeth on and they are now living a lot longer um and so if you can keep their teeth as in as good a condition as possible, their chances they will be able to last a lot longer and not need to change too much of their diet, although Donna might correct me on this. Um, but if you can keep their teeth in good nick, um, they won't have to change on sloppier feed too early. I'm excellently explained. I think we might just be having a couple of issues just with the, the picture, but we can still hear you perfectly well. So apologies uh, to viewers if there's a little bit of uh, fuzziness, but uh, we can hear you, which is the most important thing. Um, we're going to actually move on to some uh, PowerPoint, some uh, slides of images which you've got, which I think will actually demonstrate um, the next question, which is what are some of the most common findings that you experience with former racehorses? So I think um, I'll hand over to you to talk us through these slides, which again, if you've had your dinner or you're about to, I'm really sorry, but brace yourself. Yeah, so I would mass massively say that these two are actually um, two ex-racers. They are um, racers horses that are in their new careers. And the one, the image on the right is a horse with retained baby teeth or retained caps as we refer to them. Um, sometimes these don't cause a problem, sometimes they can, um, and that's a good example on the image on the left. Um, that is a horse that has a retained tooth, it, the permanent tooth didn't form properly and so now it's got this nice little stubby bit. <laughs> um, in the grand scheme of things, if the horse is okay and it's eating fine, we tend not to do too much. Um, the one, the image on the right, um, they were extracted because there was a bit of food packing up behind them and it was a bit smelly causing gum recession. What I would say very clearly is that procedure was done by a dental vet. It is not something an EDT can do because the horse required sedation, elevators and things like that. It was a bit more than a standard flick out job. So that's where it fine lines of what an EDT can do and what a vet can do. Um, it would be worth just double checking. Anything that requires big extractions like that, uh, only a vet can do. Um, you can go to the next slide. Ah, so uh, the image on the left is a stick that was stuck in a horse's mouth. Um, can uh, Horses are foragers. Um, they can nibble, they go into hedgerows and things like this. Um, this particular horse, um, I was called and it was quidding slightly. Quidding is what the image you see on the right. It's where a horse basically chews up food, swallow it, rolls it in cigar shapes and drops it out. It's a really, really in, um, good sign to say the horse has got, was having dental problems. 
Um, and it could be a million and one different things. But if you see your horse doing that, definitely worth calling someone out. Um, this stick was easily removed um, and it caused a nice little soul. But the other thing to be aware of is carrots can do exactly the same thing. Carrots can stick up. So we do recommend if you can chop them up because if they go in whole, they can get wedged. And that's not a fun build you need. And um, we can go to the next slide. Um, in the video, I talked about eruption cysts. Uh, on the left here, this is a, an Arab, but it's a really good example of eruption cysts. On the bottom of the jaw, you'll see there are two bumps. Eruption, uh, eruption cysts are just a fancy word for saying teething bumps. And this is as the tooth develops, then the baby tooth sits on top. The permanent tooth is still forming and it pushes the jaw. As soon as the horse starts shedding those baby teeth, those lumps will disappear. You'll find quite, the, um, the nose will look quite square. And as soon as they disappear, they sink in a little bit. On smaller heads, such as Shetlands or smaller thoroughbreds, they may not disappear completely, but they will go. A big thing we see in a lot of racehorses is parrot mouth. And that's an example on the right. That is a three-year-old. And that is a, a nice example of a parrot mouth. True parrot mouths, they do not touch. The incisors do not touch. So the bottom teeth will sit on the hard palate, um, which isn't great. There are things you can do to help that. There are methods you can go, there are veterinary routes of trying to correct that with braces and removing of jaw bones. That's quite extensive. Or there's other ways where if you can try and balance the problems that appear in the mouth, because the whole top jaw is ahead of the lower jaw, which can then cause hooks and ramps and things like that. If you can try and keep those under control, you may find as the horse continues to develop and grows that the parrot mouth reduces in severity. Doesn't mean it will completely go, but you, there's a chance you can reduce the severity of it. Thank you very much. I think you've talked really well there about some of the confirmational faults and the issues that uh, they present. How important, I mean, people shouldn't, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, how to sort of put this, but if people go and look at a former racehorse, um, you, you sort of, we all what we want them to find brilliant homes, don't we, all of them, even if they have got confirmational faults. How worried would you be generally if you spotted a parrot mouth in a three-year-old, as you've just said, or would that particularly put you off? Or as you've said, are there actual ways with careful management, as there are with, with working closely with your dentist, your EDT, your vet, you will be able to manage it and have a happy, happy new career? Yeah, I personally wouldn't be put off by a parrot mouth. I mean, some of the, the expression, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, some of the best um, <laughs> best athletes we have there, equine-wise, have got horrendous mouths. Um, so it wouldn't write off at all, but it would just be regular dental care, keeping it under control. That'd be the best thing to do, basically. Okay. And um, we get a lot of people, obviously, um, rehoming, uh, finding new homes for older horses, younger horses. We get a lot that come off the flats, which are most likely to be younger. We get a lot that are coming from National Hunt, which a lot of the time, you know, a 13, 14 year old ex uh, National Hunt horse. Uh, the difference in those two, how would you advise people if they're just getting a new horse, a three year old ex flat horse, a 12 year old ex National Hunt? What sort of differences, obvious differences would be required in the sort of general maintenance of teeth for those two groups? So it, any we tend to recommend or anything under 10 ideally should be seen every six months and that's because um the teeth are like a slightly softer density so they are likely to get sharper quicker but the biggest thing with racehorses is because of what they are fed and then some places don't get a majority of uh long time turned out and they're sort of fed shorter fiber rather than long fiber they are big they're prone to big ridging now this ridging they naturally need to be able to eat with but sometimes it can get too big and start causing problems. And it's called, um, you might hear your professional refer to it as ATR or ETR, which is excessive transverse ridging or accentuated transverse ridging. Um, on younger horses, it is natural, again, they naturally need it to be able to grind the food down. But if it's too big, it causes a problem. You find it can be larger on younger horses. And with younger horses, you've got a bit more flexibility of being able to do a bit more um, reduction worth on teeth because you've got a bit more tooth to play with the older the horse gets you are a little bit limited on how much you can do in the mouth now at 12 you can still do a fair amount we're talking when the horse is stuck getting into their late teens early 20s then you're a bit restricted but it is always useful to have them regularly checked your professional 
we'll look at the math and we'll advise you whether this horse needs a three, six, nine or 12 month appointment, depending what's going on in there. And that will depend on how the horse is for the treatment and what's going on in the mouth. And, and finally, red flag signs that there is something amiss with your horse's mouth. What sort of common uh, signs would you be looking out for? Um, any sort of swelling. And if you notice any swelling either side of the mouth, um, any chewing problems like we talked about quidding um, can be a sign. Horses dunking hay in water. Some horses do it as a habit, but that can be a good sign. Um, reaction in the bridle, um, any nasal discharge or anything like that. It's not saying it's definitely tooth, but if I come across with a horse with a, a nasal discharge down one side, I'm pretty a bit, a bit concerned and I'd be like, yeah, I think we need to have a little look in there and possibly needs a bit further examination with a vet. Brilliant. Thank you very much, B. And Jenny, just to wrap up the sort of dentistry section, um, just underline again for us the importance and any experiences that you might have had, where, how important that we just can't uh, overlook this area, can we? We just cannot overlook dentistry in any way with these former racehorses. Yeah. No, no, absolutely, Mark. And I guess just to clarify what I said in my previous comments about ulcers, um, I think if you if you really if there really is an ulcer problem, then yes, it's important to diagnose it and diagnose it and treat it. But I think for me, getting the horses dentistry done properly, um, getting him on the right diet and managing his socialization and lifestyle, those are the things to focus on first and, and get some stability there. But yeah, I've, um, you might remember, those of you that saw last year's video, um, the, one of the, the French horse that we looked at that was very poor and underweight and um, really didn't eat much hay. Um, and when you initially looked in his mouth superficially, he'd, he'd clearly had some dental work done in training um, so the front of his mouth was very good, but when you put the speculum on and examined him properly, he had the biggest hooks at the back. And, you know, I could completely understand why the poor soul wasn't eating any forage. So, um, you know, they need a proper dental exam. And, and another one that absolutely sticks in my mind is a lovely little former racehorse who had had... Um, and the lady who owned him had, had done the right thing. She'd, she'd had, she had had a BADEDT do the routine dental check. And this horse was kind of grinding to a halt when he was ridden. Um, it was kind of like his way of saying, my, you know, I'm uncomfortable, I can't go forwards. Um, you know, he'd had an MRI, he'd had his feet MRI'd, which surprise, surprise, of course they were completely normal. Because actually... He had an issue with his bite at, at the back of his mouth so that he was uncomfortable in his TMJ joints. You know, he, he clearly had quite a crooked bite. Um, so some work to sort that out, get him comfortable in his mouth. Um, then he went back to, to being, um, you know, the really cool, sweet little horse that he'd been when he was initially retrained. So, um, you know, I, I think it's just one of those things that is is completely you know along with saddle fitting that we're about to talk about next um tack fitting I, I think making sure that they really are comfortable in their mouth um i cannot emphasize that too strongly absolutely i think anybody that's had their own dental toothache i mean it's it's miserable isn't it it affects everything so you know if if horses are, have any sort of issue um i can see why it affects everything that we do with them thank you very much jenny uh, moving on then, uh, last but not least, uh, to the saddle. So I think everyone's making a list of things that they've got to do. It's all getting very expensive and it's not going to get any cheaper now because we're going to talk about the type of saddle that you need to uh, get to yourself because there are differences. Kay, good evening to you. Um, evening. There are big differences, aren't there, between the sort of saddles that these horses will have been wearing uh, each morning on the gallops and to the sorts of saddles now that we're going to be throwing on them to go and have a nice hack or a schooling session. Uh, what would be the key considerations that you would say people need to have in mind when they've got their new former racehorse and it's day one and we're looking at fitting a new saddle? I think the first thing to do is realise that the modern riding saddle as opposed to the race exercise saddle is something totally different from the horse's point of view. We have a full tree that supports the back of the seat, whereas on the race exercise, most of these are on a little half tree and the back is soft and felt. So it is going to feel unfamiliar. 
But the one thing I would say is the first saddle that you buy, please don't think that this is going to last right the way through his career. Because the one thing I can guarantee is a racehorse after training is going to completely and absolutely change shape in the first year tremendously, but thereafter will continue. Now, there are adjustable saddles, and that would be what I would advise. But please don't go and spend a lot of money on your first saddle thinking, that's it, I'm going to have this wonderful saddle made for him, which will last him right the way through. But in the same breath, please don't go and think, oh, there's that old saddle in the corner of the tack room. I can stick that on him to start him. You can't. If you start off with a painful saddle, the horse is going to think saddles are painful. So the first one needs to be comfortable. And that might sound like a contradiction in terms to say it must be comfortable, but you don't want to buy the best one. There are some very good synthetic saddles out there, so long as they're on the right shape of tree and with the right panel, or some cheaper leather ones that will really do to get you started, will be comfortable for the horse, will be comfortable for you, and it's just as important that you are comfortable, because if you're not comfortable, you'll be moving, and the horse has to rebalance you every time you move. So I would say start with a really good synthetic or one of the really good but cheaper adjustable saddles, make sure that the tree has longer tree points. I can show you that. This is the sort of tree that you will find. I don't know if you can see that. I don't, um, I don't think we're getting a, a great no, view of that. Through very well. of that K. Um, the points of the tree that come down either side of the horse, they must be of a long enough length to support the panel and the panel must be cut deeper. And that's because I have yet to see a racehorse, a thoroughbred, no matter how well covered he is, in which the dorsal spinous process, the sticky up spine, start the highest one at the wither, aren't much longer than most normal horses or most ordinary um, warm blood horses, say. So on a thoroughbred horse, the dorsal spinous process at the point of the wither can be up to 30 centimetres long. That connects to the thoracic vertebrae, which is where the rib cage comes off. And it's at that rib cage that the saddle is supported. So you need a deep cut panel and a longer tree point to support that panel so that the saddle is supported against the rib cage rather than on the muscle above it. If you think about muscle, I always say to people, try and make your leg really hard and then push your thumb in and see if you can stop your thumb going into your muscle. And you can't, you can't make that muscle hard enough. So if you have a saddle sitting above the rib cage, all that it'll do is squash the muscle, which of course is uncomfortable. It will cause atrophy, it will restrict the blood flow, and it's really not a good thing. So whichever saddle you get to start with, please make sure it has a deep panel and long tree points. Excellent comments there. Um, and you've actually answered a couple of the questions that, that we had about, about the trees. And obviously you've just confirmed, which is brilliant, that basically it is similar to when you fit a young horse that's maybe a non-race horse, because you're expecting and, and very much anticipating that he's going to change shape. Well, that's true, except for the fact that with a young horse, you are working from uh, an undeveloped horse. The muscle is not fit. It's not in work. It hasn't been used for a particular task other than wandering about and eating grass and being a nice baby horse. So when you've got a horse out of training, it has been trained hard, its muscle tone is very firm, it's very elastic, but for a riding horse, it's probably all in the wrong place. So yes, it is going to change shape, but you're not just building muscle as you are with the young horse, it's more that you are rebuilding muscle, which means you have to take away, develop the new muscle, rather than the muscle that exists from the racing horse. Okay, brilliant. And, and for those that maybe have had a former racehorse for a while here, um, what are the sort of signs that they should be looking out for that tell them that a saddle fitting or a saddle check is, is due? What are the main signs, not only of discomfort really, because we don't really want to let it get to that point, do we? But 
any signs of discomfort and any sort of good practice that you would advise and recommend? I think we all know about clearance, um, that there should be clearance to the top and sides of the wither and to the spine right through. But please don't get hung up on two, three or four fingers because it rather depends whose fingers they are, uh, that they could be as much as an, uh, uh, two or three centimetres different between one person and another. So that's really not much help. And also that what we need is clearance to the top and sides. It doesn't have to be a huge amount. If you've got a horse with a very high wither that drops away behind it, then if you're trying to get three or four of anybody's fingers clearance, you're going to tip the saddle back. And to get that level, you're really going to have to build the back up. If it's not level, the rider will be sitting on the back of the saddle and strangely enough, leaning forward to try and keep their balance. So the rider's completely out of balance. All of the pressure is going through the back of the saddle it's not helping. So this is why sometimes on a high withered horse, especially if they're recently out of training, we might have slightly less clearance than you might expect, but there is still clearance, but the saddle must balance. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Very finally, how does the audience watching this, how, how do they go about finding a good qualified saddle fitter? Well, in my opinion, there's only one qualification that counts, and that's the Society of Master Saddlers qualified saddle fitter or master saddle fitter. To become a qualified saddle fitter, you have to have done three years of work, training and education before you can even sit the exam. So, and they are totally unattached to any particular firm. So we don't favor one firm over another. We just support British saddlery. So that's the person to go to. If you look at the Society of Master Saddlers websites, which is www.mastersaddlers.co.uk. Um, they will have a list of qualified and master saddle fitters within your area. It's done under counties and countries because we do have a worldwide presence. And you should be able to find from that somebody who is knowledgeable enough to do the job for you, who will understand what you're needing. And just uh, something just to throw in here at you as well. When you're looking at uh, fitting a saddle, quite often when somebody gets maybe a slightly underweight or some, certainly under conditioned former racers, they might be tempted to throw on four thick saddle pads under said saddle. How would you go about fitting? What sort of numbness saddle, saddle cloth would you be looking at using thickness of that as well? Because what, what's your thoughts on that? Initially, I would go for an adjustable saddle anyway so that you can keep the width sitting, uh, fitting correct because if the tree is too wide, no amount of pads will actually make it fit better. You might think it fits better, but the pressures are still coming through the front um, because it's not balanced out. So go for adjustable. And then with pads, um, try not to use too much because it can make the saddle unstable. But horses do like something under the saddle Thoroughbred horses in particular seem to like uh, something a little bit softer. For a reason I totally fail to understand, a lot of them were like a sheepskin half pad on top of a cotton saddle cloth, which shouldn't work. It should be the sheepskin, but it does. It works and it saves you having to wash the sheepskin, which is much harder than the cotton cloth. Um, so sheepskin half pad, so long as it's big enough, where they roll the sheepskin at the back, that mustn't come under the saddle, even when you've washed it and shrunk it. Um, other ones, um, I'm a great believer in closed cell pads. I use ProLite pads a lot. It uh, is a great distributor of pressure over a wider area. They fit nicely. There's clearance down the spine, which is so, so important. And, um, I do not like gel pads. I find they tend to be heavy and pull down across the spine. We spend all of our time trying to keep the saddle above the spine, and then you go and put something that pulls down. But there are many, many options. Uh, a lot of them are very good. I would suggest that if you're going to use a product, look to see if there's been any research done on it and if it's been published. Because okay, a lot brilliant. of things. Say? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. One very final thing, because we're going to have to move on to the okay. uh, Q&A, because I know time's slightly against us. Yep. Um, we, we've got a, a couple of questions 
uh, coming in. Uh, one of them also just asks very briefly um, the importance of getting the horses back checked. So very, very first, uh, before you even move on to finding that, that saddle, how important is getting your horses back checked before you do anything else? I think it's very important because certainly on the jumper chasers, most of them had a fall and quite a lot of them have problems. Uh, Society of Master Saddlers Fitter will check the back when they're doing a fitting, but that is just to see if there's anything that's going to affect the fit that would prevent us fitting. If you have a good relationship with a physio or a similar person who would check the back with you, it's nice to work in conjunction with them professionals should always work together. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. So we're just going to try and whisk through a few questions that have come in. Thanks for sending all your questions. We're not going to get to all of them, but we will get them answered by email after the webinar. Uh, we always run over because we all just like to talk. Um, uh, the question, Donna, um, coming to you. So find where where uh, Donna's probably just gone off to have a drink. No, she's here with us. Um, <laughs> Donna, there's quite a few for you, as you'd expect, really. Feeding's always a huge topic. Uh, this one, the condition scoring is very interesting. However, is there a way currently of measuring bone density and muscle mass? Uh, it's similar to the way, I guess, as if a human goes to a gym and they can stand on a pedestal and hold those hand grips and have everything assessed. Is there any way of sort of having a detailed analysis of a horse's fat, muscle mass and bone density. And actually, an additional question to this, which I'm adding, do how much of that information do you really need to get a good feed uh, regime going? Well, I'll be brutally honest with you. It's not something that I use. And, um, you know, if, if that is available, I know there are all sorts of things actually available to us now. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if, of course, we can get that information, yes. But in terms of actually pulling together the, 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 the diet, if you like, for most scenarios that we're talking about now, um, then no, really what you need is that very basic weight taping and body condition scoring to be able to move forward from that. OK, and another question for you. This is from Catherine Garson. Uh, I have a horse who last raced in March. He's in medium work, lots of hay and turnout, has had his teeth done. He has been wormed. He's still very ribby and light. He's on ease and Excel cubes plus linseed oil. Not sure where to go now. Obviously, we're not getting all the information about, but that's yeah. sort of very basic. I think the key thing for this is I, I really haven't got all the information. So what I would check first of all is are you feeding the correct amount of the Eason Excel cubes? So certainly what I find with, with um, you know, a lot of owners is they're not necessarily feeding um, the manufacturer's recommendation, shall we say. And in a lot of cases, they don't need to. Um, it, it could be that they're using it alongside a balancer because they, they don't need it for the extra weight, not necessarily in the case of Eason Excel, which is designed to put weight on, but I would check that you're feeding the right amount. And if let's just take your, your average 500 kilo um, here, typically of these and Excel cubes, you, you're going to be looking at feeding three to three and a half kilos, of course, splitting that um, amongst at least two feeds. And, and obviously I don't know if you're at that point, so that would be the, the, the first thing that you could do. Um, the second thing moving on from there, if you are feeding um, the right amount um, is of course, make sure the horse is physically eating enough forage. It's one thing um, giving it enough. Is it, is it eating enough? Um, and then we, we would look to introduce a higher energy, therefore calorie feed if, if necessary, possibly using um oil uh, as we need to but it's a little bit difficult to comment without knowing the actual weights of the feed okay and very quickly uh, if you could a uh, final question for you is a uh, lady's uh, got two x-ray sources the turnout at the moment is is in small paddocks they're not uh, particularly good quality grazing uh, she's feeding them feed licks ad lib haylage overnight uh, and sometimes hay bricks and hay in the field uh, in the winter feeding healthy tummy supplement, carrots, apples, and a biotin supplement, but still quite concerned that they are not getting enough nutrients. What advice would you be giving her? I'd say the, the key thing from that was actually said very early on, the feed lick side of, of that. And by that, I'm presuming she means a mineral lick. Um, the thing I would say about that 
is whilst they may be useful, it's not typically something I tend to recommend purely because we don't truly know the intake that that horse is getting, i.e. are they licking it enough? Are they licking it too much? Is there one horse that's having more than his fair share and the other one just isn't taking any at all? Um, it's a lot easier if you can con use a more of a controlled either pelleted balancer or you can get powdered um, vitamin and mineral balancers as well and just pop it in there as opposed to um, using the lick. That's the, that's probably the key that I would draw from that. Thank you very, very much, Don. I hope that's answered those questions. Uh, Jenny Hall, I'm going to come to you with this one. Uh, Lindsay Salmon has asked, will some horses recover from ulcers? Uh, will they return? Um, will they recover without treatment um, and just a simple change of management or do they specifically need some uh, veterinary intervention? I think they will absolutely recover without veterinary in intervention. And I think that very often happens e even with horses that stay in a training yard, actually. Um, you know, sometimes a horse, you know, maybe it changes job and it becomes the trainer's hack or it gets injured and so it's no longer doing such intense exercise. Um, and you can see those horses suddenly start to put condition on and, and look well when they hadn't done before. And I personally have, you know, it's a bit anecdotal, but I kind of think that's probably something to do with their ulcers improving. But, you know, they certainly can change completely um, with the changes of diet, the changes of uh, management routine, the change of socialization. Um, and, and so, you, you know, absolutely, that is a possibility. And they're very, you know, they can change very quickly ulcers. So even if you scope the horse, it is a bit of a moment in time. Um, and sometimes, sometimes they can be very difficult to get rid of um, and get to heal up, even with all of the kind of, you know, suppose it's, you know, the, the normal treatments. So I think they are very much an individual horse issue. And yes, absolutely, um, they may well resolve completely with nothing other than the change of management with the horse having come out of training. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, B, this one is for uh, you. It's all about wind sucking um, and which is now affecting the horse's front teeth. Um, and this uh, is an anonymous a question, but asking whether they should be trying to stop the wind sucking, i.e. probably using some form of collar um, to protect the teeth. Now, obviously, we discussed this last year. Uh, it's quite a controversial thing, isn't it? Stopping them doing these vices, because clearly that's how they manage and that's how they almost like smoking, I suppose. But uh, anyway, in terms of if you've got a horse that's got visible veterinary dentistry issues going on, should you be trying to stop those vices? It's definitely something I would consider looking at. There was a study, and for the life of me, I can't remember the name of the guy, but he did a study on wind sucking, and he literally he said it was like smoking. The first hit when they do it, they like they try and replicate it. Um, it. If it's very slight, depending on how severe the horse does it, so you get some that can do very slight wind sucking, and it barely does anything. Brilliant. If it's quite excessive, there is a chance of them going through the layers of teeth and opening up their pulp, um, so their, their nerve channels in the teeth. That is where it becomes problematic, and then you have to start looking at procedures of either extracting the teeth or possibly repairing the teeth, so that we now do fillings and root canals for horses, but that is expensive. So I, if, there, if it is excessive, you can look at um, collars and things like that, but what I would say if a horse is determined to crib, it will crib. So it might be worth looking at other ways of helping that behaviour um, and giving the horse something else to um, take that behaviour out on, if that makes sense. Excellent. Thank you very much, B, for that. And finally, Kay, this one is to you. Um, this uh, lady has said she has a 17-2 former racehorse, actually been having a break for 12 months, um, doesn't have thousands of pounds to spend on a new saddle, can you recommend any tips about how she can ensure a saddle, uh, a good fitting saddle can be purchased on a budget, if that is possible, while she works on him? So I suppose synthetic saddles, perhaps, are going to be cheaper in price. What would you, what would you recommend? Yes, um, the company Thoroughgood do two, two standards of synthetic saddle. They're both very well designed and very well made, and they would be a good start. They also do a high wither version. 
which uh, of course is ideal for the uh, uh, thoroughbreds because they also have a deeper gusset at the back so that you can balance the saddle out with the high weather. Um, so they're the T4 on the T8. Um, and also Kenton Masters is a leather version of the same one, comes in at under a thousand pounds or just on a thousand pounds. And that's a very nice saddle. All of those are adjustable. So they'll keep you going along the way until you've got your horse as you want. And then if you want something really smart, you can go on from there. And, and just uh, my, I'm going to just throw one in there as well. You mentioned at the beginning when you first buy a new saddle, expect that it's not going to be one that you've got for a long period of time. What's that sort of rough time zone that people should be thinking about budgeting for as a general rule, the average of how soon you might need to change that saddle? Yeah, of course, there's so many imponderables, but I'm thinking that um, you would probably be able to change it after a year, but you would probably be needing to change it after two. You might want to specialise, you might want to have something that really suits their now shape at that point. I wouldn't want to go on without having the saddle thoroughly checked beyond two years. Okay, brilliant. Thank you all four of you have been absolutely brilliant guests. I hope we've covered lots of uh, important questions and given the answers to as many as, as we can. Uh, there'll be loads of information as there always is on the ROR website and these Fab Four uh, will continue to support ROR and provide valuable information along the way. So do keep an eye on the website, the social media channels as well. Uh, particularly this webinar, I think more important, it's always important to emphasise that we've talked about veterinary issues, dental issues. It is going to come to the individual horse. So always take that into account and consult whoever you're working with on a regular basis, whether it be your dentist, your vet, uh, your saddle fitter as well. Uh, so thank you so much to uh, all four of you. It's been a, a real pleasure to uh, see you and you've kicked off this series of webinars really, really well. Uh, don't forget the next webinar, for those of you looking at attending more of these, is on Wednesday the 8th of December, so just a couple of weeks away now. And that is going to be covering the next stages, really, and the early stages of actually getting on your former racehorse from mounting, which sounds like a basic issue until you try and get on a former racehorse necessarily. So we're going to talk about that. There's lots to cover and we'll be building right up to some flat work tips and actually getting started, progressing up to the jumps. And for that, I'm going to be joined by Olympic gold medalist Laura Collett and the brilliant international coach Yogi Brisness. So that is going to be at one to watch. It's on the 8th of December. Uh, more information, as I say, will be on the website and the social media. So uh, nutritionist Donna Case Dental technician B. May, Master Saddler K. Hastelow, and our brilliant Dr. Jenny Hall, the ROR Head of Welfare. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you mostly for watching, and we'll see you on the 8th of December. Do have a very good evening. <laughs>